Chapter 19, The Kidney. In this chapter, we'll talk about the anatomy of the urinary system, which will be a review. Um, then we'll look at kidney function in, as an overview, and then go into specifically filtration, reabsorption, secretion, excretion, and then the process of nutrition. So what's the job of the kidney? So the function of the kidneys um, actually quite co covers quite a bit of things. So number one, it helps regulate your extracellular fluid volume. And again, if you just think about what the kidneys do, we normally think about the fact that it produces urine. Well, urine is fluid, and there are solutes dissolved in that fluid. And so by being able to either produce a lot of urine or to not produce a lot of urine, it's really going to change our extracellular fluid volume. So the more urine we produce, our extracellular fluid volume will go down. The less urine we produce, our extracellular fluid volume will stay more elevated. And we know that fluid volume can also directly impact blood pressure. <clears throat> so the more extracellular fluid we have, the greater our blood volume, our blood pressure goes up. The lower our fluid volume, our blood pressure goes down. So our kidneys not only influence fluid volume, it also influences blood pressure. Um, because the fluid that we are losing in our kidneys as urine is not just water, there are solutes dissolved in it, the kidneys are able to regulate our blood osmolarity. And it'll maintain those solutes. Um, so it'll maintain the ion balance of solutes like sodium, potassium, calcium as examples. The kidneys are also able to regulate our body's pH. <clears throat> now, the majority of pH changes are buffered by our buffer system, like uh, bicarbonate ion being our best and strongest buffer. And then we talked about how our respiratory system, through the retention or elimination of carbon dioxide, can also regulate pH. And then our kidneys also play a role. And we will do what we need. So if we are too acidic, the kidneys will remove the hydrogen and retain the bicarb. If we are too alkaline or too basic, it'll remove the um, bicarb and retain the acid. Uh, the kidneys are another way we can get rid of waste from our body. So a lot of the times when we start to build up um, things in our blood, one of the places that it'll show up is in our urine. Um, and then finally, our kidneys also produce hormones, hormones like urethropoietin, which has already been discussed. This is what stimulates urethropoiesis or the production of red blood cells. And then we have the hormone renin. This is a really important hormone. It's going to turn on our RAA, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which really um, plays a role in sodium balance, uh, fluid balance, and blood pressure. And we'll talk more about renin in the next chapter. So here's a quick overview of the anatomy of the urinary system. So we have our two kidneys. We have our um, renal arteries bringing blood to the kidneys. And then we have our renal veins bringing blood away. Whatever urine we produce from that blood that's going to get filtered in the kidney will then go down our ureter. So we'll have two on each side, or one on each side, two total. It'll go into our urinary bladder and then out the urethra. So here's a cross-section of a kidney, and you can see how elegantly it's designed. It's quite um, uh, organized. So we have the cortex on the outside, the medulla is in the middle, here's our renal pelvis. And the functional unit of your kidney, meaning the cell of the kidney that actually does the work of the kidney, are your nephrons. And so here's a blow-up of our nephrons. So we have two shown here. Um, most of our um, nephron is in the cortex, so about 20% of the nephron is in the cortex, about 20% dips down into the medulla. So whatever urine we produce in the nephron will go to the renal pelvis, again, to the ureter, to the bladder, out the urethra. So here's a closer look at our um, blood vessels that supply blood to each of the nephrons. So we'll start off with the blood vessels and then we'll uh, break down the nephron. So each nephron has to get a blood supply, and it's going to come to the nephron through the afferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole is an arteriole, so we can actually vasoconstrict or dilate these blood vessels to change the amount of blood that's going to pass through it. After our arterioles, we have our capillaries, and these are known as our glomerulus capillary, and this is where we're going to do our filtration then the blood that remains will leave the capillary. Now, normally after capillaries, we should have venules, veins, vena cava, but here we have our efferent arteriole. So again, it's an arteriole, so we can constrict or dilate here. And from the efferent arteriole, we go to another set of capillaries. This is our paratubular capillary that kind of surrounds everything else. 
And so we're going from capillary bed to capillary bed, and we know that this is known as a portal system. And this one has a much easier name than our hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system. This is known as our renal portal system. <clears throat> so that's how our blood flows. And now let's uh, break down our nephron. So notice this nephron is less convoluted than the previous one. All we did was we kind of unwound it a little bit just so that it's easier to see um, the different parts. So here again is our afferent arteriole. Our glomerulus capillary is actually inside the um, Bowman's capsule of our nephron, and there's our efferent arteriole. So the filtration ha will happen here. So we'll filter out of the glomerulus capillary into the Bowman's capsule. Now, if we want to refer to the glomerulus capillary and the Bowman's capsule together, we can call it the renal corpuscle. So whatever filtrate comes out will go from the Bowman's capsule to the proximal tubule or proximal convoluted tubule because it's proximal to where we did the filtration to the Bowman's capsule. Then from the proximal tubule, we will go down this whole loop of Henle. Now this part is the descending limb. This is where the filtrate descends down. So this is the descending limb of the loop of Henle. I like to call this the bottom of the loop of Henle. And then we have our ascending limb of the loop of Henle because here the filtrate ascends, goes up. Then we have our distal tubule or the distal convoluted tubule. And then um, several nephrons will meet at the collecting depth. So this is our collecting depth. Now whatever remains in the, at the end of the collecting duct is what will go to our renal pelvis, ureters, bladder, out the urethra. So that's what's going to become our urine. Now let's take a look at what happens at the different parts of the nephron. So the kidneys will filter uh, fluid from the blood, water as well as solutes, into the nephron. So it'll go from the blood into the nephron. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to reabsorb most of what we filtered. Now we may secrete some things, so secretion will actually move from the blood into the nephron, and then whatever remains we're going to excrete, meaning eliminate from the body. So let's take a look at what happens where. So filtration happens only here in the Bowman's capsule or the renal corpuscle, so we're going to filter from the glomerulus capillary into the Bowman's capsule. So if you look at the arrow, it's going from blood to the lumen of the nephron. Now filtration is going to happen freely, meaning as long as you can pass through the filtration membrane, um, you'll be able to filter. Now the filtrate will then travel to the proximal tubule, and in the proximal tubule, two things can happen. We're going to do a lot of reabsorbing. So reabsorbing is moving from the lumen of the nephron back into the blood, in this case the paratubular capillary, but we can also do some secretion. Now secretion, we're going to move from the blood into the lumen of the nephron. So notice in terms of direction, Filtration and secretion go in the same direction. They both go from the blood to the lumen of the nephron. So then what's the difference? Well, we already talked about filtration when we were talking about different modes of transport. You did this in the lab. So filtration is kind of mass movements. In secretion, it's very selective. So you're selectively going to take things out of the blood and put it into the nephron. So you'll do mostly reabsorption, some secretion. Then, in the entire loop of Henle, both the ascend, uh, descending and ascending limb, the only thing you do is reabsorb. So again, from lumen of the nephron to the lumen of the blood. So <clears throat> we're moving back into the blood. We're reabsorbing things back into the blood. In the distal tubule, we will continue to reabsorb, and also we can do more selective secretion. And same thing in the collecting duct. We will reabsorb and do some selective secretion. So notice, everywhere along the nephron, other than in the Bowman's capsule, we're always reabsorbing, and sometimes we'll secre uh, secrete. Now, whatever still remains in the end of the collecting duct is what will then be excreted from the body. So this would be the lumen of the nephron out into the external environment. So how much fluid are we talking about that we are filtering here in the kidneys? Well, in the Bowman's capsule, in a day, we filter 180 liters of fluid. Now that's a lot. Now the typical person has only about five to six liters of blood. So how can you filter 180 liters a day? Because what you're doing with most of what you filter is you're reabsorbing. So we're constantly recycling. The osmolarity of the filtrate has um, an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles.
Now, in the proximal tubule, remember, we are going to do mostly reabsorbing and some secretion. At the end of the proximal tubule, after all of that reabsorption, especially, we're left with about 54 liters of fluid a day. Again, same osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles. Now, remember the loop of Henle? What do we do the entire loop of Henle? We reabsorb. So at the end of the loop of Henle, so at the top of the ascending limb, we have about 18 liters of fluid going through that a day with an osmolarity of 100 milliosmoles at the top of the loop of Henle. And then in the collecting duct, at the end of the collecting duct, what's actually going to become urine, we produce about 1.5 liters of urine per day, again, on average. So we filter 180, but again, we do so much reabsorption that at the at the end of a typical day, we would produce only about a liter and a half of urine. And the urine that we produce can range in osmolarity. It can be as low as 50 and as high as 1200, depending on what happens, especially in the collecting duct. And we'll talk more about that as we continue on. So if we want to put an equation to this, okay, to see how much are we actually excreting, we can take the amount that we filtered into the tubule, subtract what we took back into the blood, so subtract what we reabsorbed, add in what we selectively secreted, and that will tell us how much we're excreting. Okay, so we can take how much of a particular solute you, you, you filtered, let's say we filtered 10, and then we reabsorbed 5, and then you secreted an extra 2, so you'll actually excrete 7. All right, so let's uh, start at the renal corpuscle and just kind of work our way down. So here's a blow up of the renal corpuscle. So here's our um, afferent arteriole, here's our glomerulus capillary, our efferent arteriole, and this is our Bowman's capsule. So together, this is our renal corpuscle. Notice our glomerulus capillary is surrounded by these big old purple looking blobs. So these are called podocytes and they create um, one of the layers of filtration. So this is where filtration is going to take place. And we're going to filter from the blood, the glomerulus capillary, into the lumen of the nephron. And so we have to filter through layers. So the first layer of filtration are, is actually made up by the uh, capillary wall itself. So the capillary wall has pores. So whatever you're going to filter has to be able to go through those pores. So it helps keep certain things, very large proteins, your red blood cells, um, out of the um, your, your urine, right? So you, you're not going to filter those. We also have a basal lamina layer that helps exclude a lot of proteins. And then those podocytes, they create these little filtration slits um, by the way that they're kind of organized um, around our capillary. So again, it just provides an extra layer of filtration so that not everything from the blood is going to move into our nephron. Um, the filtration fraction is just looking at the percentage of total plasma volume that's actually filtered in the tubule. So if you take, if we were, if we were to say, okay, we have 100% of blood coming to the nephron. So whatever is coming to the nephron through the afferent arterial is our blood. So that's 100%. We don't actually filter everything. The point is, we only filter about 20% of what comes. Most actually stays in the capillary. So about 80% stays. Only 20% gets filtered. But again. The majority of what we filter, what do we do with it? We reabsorb it. So we actually lose less than 1% of the volume uh, to the external environment. So very little actually gets excreted. Remember, only 1.5 liters of fluid. So what influences filtration and how much we filter? Um, so there are a couple of pressures, and I mentioned these before when we were talking about filtration in the capillaries, when we were talking about the blood vessels. But the two major pressures are hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure is essentially blood pressure. So wherever you have hydrostatic pressure, it's going to push fluid out of that area. That's why it's in red. Wherever you have osmotic pressure, it's going to pull fluid into that area. That's why it's purple. Okay, so let's take a look. We have blood coming into the capillaries. So the glomerulus capillary has the pressure of the blood. So there's a certain amount of blood pressure here. That hydrostatic pressure promotes filtration. And so that's why it's in red because it's gonna move um, fluids from the capillary into the lumen. Okay, so remember hydrostatic pressure, wherever you have it, it pushes fluid away from it. 
Okay, so the greater your hydrostatic pressure, and again, that's blood pressure, the greater your blood pressure, the greater the pressure or to promote filtration, okay, to promote the movement of fluids and solutes from the blood into the lumen of the nephron. Now, the other pressure was um, capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, so there is our capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Now, it's in purple because it's going to actually promote the fluid moving from the Bowman's capsule back into the capillary because the osmotic pressure is in the capillary. The name says it. It says it's capillary colloid osmotic pressure. And so the greater the solutes that we have inside the blood vessels, remember water follows solutes, it's going to promote fluid going back into the capillary. So remember, where you have, wherever you have osmotic pressure, you're going to promote fluid coming towards it. So it opposes filtration. And then the last one is actually your capsule fluid pressure. It's the essential, essentially it's hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's capsule. So it's purple because it also promotes um, or opposes filtration, but it still follows the same rule, meaning wherever you have hydrostatic pressure, it pushes fluid away from it. So this piece of fluid is the fluid pressure in the Bowman's capsule here. So it's the hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's capsule. So what does it do? It pushes fluid away from it. So in this case, it's going to promote fluid going from the Bowman's capsule back into the capillary. Now, total net filtration pressure will then be the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries that promotes filtration minus the other two that oppose it. So depending on what these numbers are, we will have our net filtration pressure. So in this example, the hydrostatic pressure is 55. So we want to filter blood with a pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury. The osmotic pressure in the capillary wants to pull it back with a pressure of 30 and the fluid pressure in the Bowman's capsule wants to pull it back with a pressure of 15. So if we were to do the math, 55 minus 30 minus 15, we have a net filtration pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. So that's what we will filter with. Now let's say our blood pressure changes. If our blood pressure goes up, if this hydrostatic pressure goes up to 65 instead of 55, what is that going to do to our net filtration pressure? It's going to raise it by 10. Or let's say the capillary colloid osmotic pressure, the solutes in our blood, goes down. Instead of 30, it goes down to 20. That means the pressure to oppose filtration went down by 20. So again, it would be 55 minus 20 minus 15, so this would go up by another 10. Okay, so hopefully um, this makes sense. Now, that being said, we actually filter 180 liters a day, and that stays constant over a range of blood pressures. Now, wait a minute. We just said how when we raise our blood pressure, our, cap, our uh, hydrostatic pressure goes up, so we will have a greater pressure to filter. Now, that is true, but what they found was when our blood pressure, our mean arterial blood pressure, is between 80 to 180, we will consistently filter 180 liters per day. So how is that possible? It's possible because of something called autoregulation. Our blood vessels will regulate themselves to maintain this 180 liters of fluid being filtered per day over a range of blood pressures. And so let's take a look at that happening. So here we have blood going through our afferent arterial to our glomerulus capillary and then the efferent arterial taking it away. So we have a certain amount of our glomerular filtration rate happening, right? How much we're filtering. Now let's say um, our afferent arterials vasoconstricted. Remember, arterials can constrict or dilate. So if our afferent arterial vasoconstricts, that will increase resistance to blood flow. That means there's going to be less blood flowing through our afferent arteriole, which means there's going to be less fluid going into our capillary. When there's less fluid going into our glomerulus capillary, that's going to decrease our hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. So overall, our glomerular filtration rate will go down. On the other hand, if we were to constrict the efferent arteriole, that will increase the resistance to blood flow through this vessel which means less blood will leave our capillary, 
which means more of the blood will stick around in the capillary and kind of build up. So it'll build up our hydrostatic pressure, which will promote greater glomerular filtration. So when our overall mean arterial blood pressure goes up, that's going to increase our hydrostatic pressure and we're gonna to start to filter more fluids in the kidney. But we don't wanna do that. We wanna filter our 180 liters a day. So our body will auto-regulate that itself. So if we're filtering too much, we want to filter less. So which blood vessel would we want to vasoconstrict? We'd want to vasoconstrict the afferent. Because if we vasoconstrict the afferent, it will decrease the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary and decrease our GFR back down to normal. On the other hand, if our blood pressure falls and we filter too little, we want to filter more. So the way that our body will respond will be by constricting the efferent and that will build up the hydrostatic pressure here to increase our GFR back to normal. So even though blood pressure definitely changes our um, hydrostatic pressure and as a result, our filtration rate, our blood vessels will regulate themselves. So we have this auto-regulation um, to respond appropriately so that even though we have this huge range in blood pressure from 80 to 180, we will still filter 180 liters of blood per day. <clears throat> so um, that's because our blood vessels are surrounded by smooth muscle. And remember, smooth muscles can contract all by themselves, that myogenic response. Um, hormones and the autonomic nervous system can also play in, play a role in constricting um, blood vessels appropriately. And then we have something called tubuloglomerular feedback. So let's take a look at that here <clears throat> and the next slide. So to talk about tubuloglomerular feedback, I want to point out um, that here's our, uh, our uh, renal corpuscle, and then we have our proximal tubule. And notice our descending limb goes down here and our lubricantly actually loops up this way. So our ascending limb goes up this way. And so do you see how our ascending limb goes right next to our afferent arteriole? So this circle here is part of our ascending limb. Notice it is passing right next to our afferent arteriole. Now this is important, okay? Because when we filter too much and we're starting to have a greater glomerular filtration rate, we're gonna have fluid passing through our tubules at a faster rate. And as it moves through at a faster rate, it goes past these special cells here. So there are these special cells inside the ascending limb of the loop of Henle where it passes next to the afferent arteriole. So the um, special cells are found right here inside the ascending limb and they're called your macula densa cells. And so when the macula densa cells um, sense that we have a lot of fluid kind of passing by it, it will release a paracrine. A paracrine is just a chemical that's released by one cell that acts on another. So the macula densa cells are the cells that release the paracrine and it'll, it'll act on the afferent arterioles and cause them to vaso, what do you think? We have too much filtration happening, so we wanna decrease the filtration, so we would cause the afferent arterioles to vasoconstrict. So by vasoconstricting the afferent, less blood goes into the capillary, reducing the hydrostatic pressure here and then decreasing the filtration rate back to normal. So this is another way we can uh, regulate our um, filtration. Now the gr granular cells here are just pointed out. They're right next to the afferent arteriole because they secrete the hormone renin and we'll talk more about that in the next slide but it's listed here so I just want to point that out. So here is that tubuloglomerular feedback. So stage one, we have a lot of filtration happening. Our GFR, glomerular filtration rate, has increased. So we have blood flow through the tube, tubules increasing. So we have a lot of, not blood, sorry, a lot of filtrate from the blood moving through our tubules. And so it will flow past those macula densa cells pretty quickly. And so the macula densa cells that are inside the afer, uh, ascending limb of the loop of Henle will sense all of that fluid going past it really quickly and release a paracrine. And that paracrine will act on the afferent arteriole and cause it to vasoconstrict. And that constriction will decrease the hydrostatic pressure inside the capillaries so that our GFR will decrease back to normal.
Okay, so this is another way we auto-regulate tubulo-glomerular feedback because the tubules are feeding back onto the glomerulus capillary. Okay, so that's what's happening in the um, renal corpuscle. So that's a lot about filtration. Now let's go on to reabsorption. So remember, reabsorption is another important function of the kidneys. And this is where we're going to take the contents from the lumen of the nephron and bring it back into the blood. And so let's take a look at reabsorption in the proximal tubule because this is where we're going to do the majority of the reabsorption. So let's start off by reabsorbing sodium. So sodium gets reabsorbed via active transport. So our active transporter that plays a role in this is our sodium-potassium pump. So if you recall, it moves three sodium out, two potassium in, and it needs ATP. So we need energy to reabsorb this sodium. Now sodium is a cation. So the more sodium we reabsorb, who do you think is going to be attracted to positive ions? Remember, opposite charges attract. So our anions will then get reabsorbed via electrochemical gradient. Now that we have reabsorbed a lot of sodium and anions, we have a lot of solutes over here. And who gets attracted to solutes? Water. Remember, water follows solutes. So then water will get reabsorbed because of osmosis. And potassium, calcium, and urea will get reabsorbed via diffusion. Now, they were not initially reabsorbed because their levels were relatively low. But now that we got rid of a lot of solutes and especially getting rid of a lot of water, their concentration is now all of a sudden higher than over here in the extracellular fluid, so now they'll get reabsorbed via diffusion from high to low concentration. So this is um, an example of how we will reabsorb in the proximal tubule. Another thing you can add here is glucose. We will also reabsorb glucose here in the um, proximal tubule, and we'll talk more about that as we move on. So the reabsorption can happen through transepithelial transport, where it goes through the membrane, so both the apical and the basal lateral membrane, or it can go between the cells. That's our paracellular uh, pathway. So here's our sodium being reabsorbed. So again, this is through active transport. So there's our sodium-potassium pump playing a role in the process. So we're going to move three sodium out, two potassiums in. And then here's our glucose. So I said add glucose to this. So glucose is reabsorbed through SGLT. So that's our sodium glucose linked transporter. And this is an example of our secondary active transport. So what this tells you is glucose needs sodium to get reabsorbed. Okay, so we will filter glucose. But what we're going to do, as long as we're not diabetic or have any issues, is we're going to be able to reabsorb all of the glucose back into the blood and not... Um, lose it in urine. So we really shouldn't um, see a lot of glucose in our urine. Um, other things that do get reabsorbed, we said urea. So initially urea is um, not that elevated in the filtrate, but because we've reabsorbed a lot of solutes in water, their concentration starts to rise. So then they will get reabsorbed via diffusion from high to low concentration. And then if we have some plasma proteins, because they're bigger, we will reabsorb them through transcytosis. Remember, that's where we endocytose on one side into a vesicle, take the vesicle to the other side of the cell, and exocytose it out. Now, a lot of the process of reabsorption happens through a protein. And so whenever we are moving through a protein, one thing we have to keep in mind is the fact that we can reach saturation. So here's an example, or here's a, a, a graph that goes over that. So as the concentration of our substrate rises, so we're going to use glucose as our example, as the concentration of glucose rises in the plasma, we are going to reabsorb more of that substrate. Okay, so sorry, let's say this is in the um, tubules of the nephron. So as glucose rises in the tubules of the nephron, we're going to transport more of them. So the rate increases in a linear fashion. But at a certain point, we are using all of our glucose transporters. So if we're using all of our SGLTs, adding more glucose won't allow us to reabsorb it at a faster rate because now all of our transporters are being utilized. So the concentration at which we reach that saturation point is called our renal threshold. And once you reach that saturation point, adding more glucose, you can't transport it at a faster rate. So the rate is going to stay the same, and that's our transport maximum. That's the maximum rate we can transport glucose. 
So let's use glucose and look at what's happening in the nephron. So filtration is free, right? So filtration doesn't go through a protein. So as long as you have more glucose in the blood, you'll just filter more in the nephron or in the glomerulus capillary. So as your blood glucose levels rise, you'll just filter more and more and more into the nephron. So that's a linear fashion. But we said what we want to do with the glucose that we filtered is we want to reabsorb it back into the blood. To do that, we have to go through proteins. So this is where a saturation can come in. So as our glucose rises, so as our blood glucose rises, we know we're going to increase filtration. But as our blood glucose rises and we filter more and we are trying to reabsorb it back into the blood, we will do that at a faster rate as the concentration rises. But at a certain point, all of our transporters are being utilized. And so after that, we can't transport them any quicker, even though we add more glucose. So the transport, um, the renal threshold at which we reach saturation is 300 milligrams per 100 milliliters of plasma. And the maximum transport rate is 375 milligrams per minute. Now, the normal range of blood glucose is between 1 and 200 around there. So what this tells us is as long as we're in the normal range, whatever we filter, we will be able to reabsorb it all back. But if we ever filter more than that 300, okay, more than the um, renal threshold, then we're not able to reabsorb it all back. And so that's when we start to see it excreted in urine. So notice we don't start to see it in the urine until we exceed that renal threshold. And the more we exceed it, the more glucose we will be able to see in your urine because we just weren't able to reabsorb it all back. So um, if I have time in um, lecture, uh, I will show you a video about um, I Love Lucy and the chocolate factory. And it gives a great example of um, this happening. It's a good analogy. All right, so secretion is another thing that we do in the proximal tubule as well as other the distal tubule and the collecting duct but secretion is selective so again we're moving from the lumen of the nephron i'm sorry the the blood into the lumen of the nephron but it's a selective process um, so for example we can secrete hydrogen ions potassium ions when we need to so it's a more selective process um, an interesting thing is penicillin. Penicillin is um, secreted and it's actually freely secreted. So we used to actually lose penicillin through filtration as well as through, sec through secretion in the urine. So we'd actually lose a lot um, in, our, in our urine. And then whatever remains in our collecting duct, at the end of the collecting duct, after we have filtered and then reabsorbed and secreted, that is what's going to be excreted from the body. And clearance is the rate at which a solute disappears from the body by excretion or by metabolism. And a non-invasive way to measure um, glomerular filtration rate, or clearance is a non-invasive way to measure your glomerular filtration rate. And there's something called inulin and creatinine. Um, these are freely filtered. They are not reabsorbed and not secreted. So if they are freely filtered and not reabsorbed and not secreted, basically you are gonna excrete everything you filter. So inulin and creatinine are unique because of that. Now creatinine is actually a breakdown byproduct of phosphocreatine. So your body not normally makes it at a constant rate and we lose it at a constant rate. And so um, we can actually use creatinine levels to look at kidney function. Inulin is from a plant. So um, they would actually have to give you inulin to um, take if they want to look at what your clearance um, looks like. Um, so inulin, like I said, is freely filtered. But again, remember, we don't always filter everything that goes to the capillary. We only filter about 20%. The rest kind of stays in the blood. But basically, whatever we filter, all of it will be cleared from the body. None of it is reabsorbed. None, none of it is secreted. So we'll excrete 100% of what we filter. Um, so we can actually compare... Um, the uh, clearance of a substance to the clearance of inulin because we know inulin clearance is always 100%. So if we were to say that the clearance of some substance is less than the clearance of inulin, that means we lost, we um, excreted less of a solute than inulin. So what must have happened to some of that solute as it was going through the nephron? We must have reabsorbed some of it. 
If we clear the same as inulin, because and again, everything that's cleared in inulin was what was filtered, that means that substance was neither reabsorbed or secreted. And then if we clear more than inulin, that means the only reason that was possible is because we actually secreted some of that product into, or that substance into the Nephron. Okay, so let's take a look at glucose. So glucose is freely filtered, and as long as we're within the re normal range of glucose, which is less than, 300, uh, less than 300, because 300 is our renal threshold, we will be able to reabsorb it all back into the blood. So we really should clear zero. We really should not lose anything from the blood. And then urea. So if you recall, urea is uh, reabsorbed via diffusion, and diffusion stops when you reach equilibrium. So we'll always clear about 50%, because once you reabsorb half, there's no gradient. And then penicillin I mentioned is quite unique because we will freely filter it, but in addition, we'll actually secrete it selectively from the blood. So we'll actually add more into the nephron. So you actually um, clear over 100%. So we lose a lot in your urine. And now whatever is going to become urine will go down the renal pelvis into the uh, ureters, into the bladder. So here's our bladder in the relaxed state. It's smooth muscle, it's like a balloon. So as more urine comes in, it will fill up and stretch. Now normally, the sphincter, I'm gonna focus on the external sphincter because it's made up of skeletal muscle, so you can control it. it we have a motor neuron that is tonically being activated. So this motor neuron is constantly firing to keep the sphincter closed. And now our bladder is gonna fill up, and when it fills up and stretches our bladder wall, the stretch receptors will send that sensory information through sensory neurons into the spinal cord, and it will do two things. It'll inhibit that motor neuron to allow the external sphincter to relax and open up, and it'll stimulate the parasympathetic neuron, which will activate our smooth muscles of the bladder to contract. So you can call it a parasympathetic motor neuron in this case, because it's going to muscle, but it's a parasympathetic neuron. Now, this is a reflex, it's a spinal reflex. That's why babies just pee when their, urine, their bladder is full. Um, and then as we get older, we start to learn how to control this reflex. And that is it for this chapter. Thank you.